All right, stop no, and tell me when you start filming. <laughs> Have you ever been on a road trip and saw a sign on the side of the road advertising the world's largest pistachio? Or maybe you were in New York and witnessed a 97-year-old soda shop that still makes coke the old-fashioned way. How outdated is that going to be by the time I get this video out, my lord? If you're a fan of those weird and often stupid travel destinations, then boy do I have a site for you. The Atlas Obscura is a travel website that I dig. It's dedicated to archiving the strange, off-the-beaten path, and often forgotten tourist attractions of the world, but mostly the USA. Now, strange, off-the-beaten path things are my bread and butter, and that's why this year I decided to grab my buddy Jake and I went to see every Atlas Obscura location in our home state, Alabama. What sounded like an easy road trip to knock out in a few days would turn into one of the most taxing and yet rewarding things I had ever done. We saw magical things, mundane things, and things somewhere in between. So join me as I tell you about our journey through all 83 Atlas Obscura locations in Alabama. Face reveal, by the way. I should note a few things before we start. The Atlas is user curated, so some of the stuff is not going to be accurate, as you'll see from the surprising amount of times we just drove up to someone's house. The criteria for this trip is that we have to visit each location and, when applicable, do the thing there. I've made an effort to be there at open hours in all parts of this trip, but sometimes that just wasn't possible or didn't work out with the route we had. Some places were closed for renovations, closed for the season, or any number of things, but for the most part we got to every attraction and saw what was there. The only location that we did not go to at all is this one, the Melanin Cafe. Because while the other attractions that were marked as permanently closed we could still visit the remains of, the Melanin Cafe has been replaced by a Marco's Pizza, and we didn't want to drive hours out of the way to visit a Marco's Pizza. Sorry, Marco. On this seven-day journey, we'd be taking my bad car, the Toyota Highlander. It was sold to me by a guy named Chalmsy, and he told me it would get 40 miles to the gallon, and it was barely used. It does not do that. For added fun, I'm going to be grading every spot we visit on a tier list because YouTube loves that kind of shit. Now, let's get started. We started off in Huntsville at somewhere we both know very well, the Space and Rocket Center. At the Space and Rocket Center were three attractions to see, and luckily for the both of us, we could see them from the outside, which means we didn't have to spend like 80 bucks going into this place. The Space and Rocket Center is cool and all, but when you drive past the Saturn V every day to work, it loses its luster a little bit. Still, I can recognize that it's a damn cool museum, and that's exemplified by the first attraction, the Pathfinder. Meet the Pathfinder rocket, something which, until I wrote this script, I thought was a scale model, but it's actually the real thing. They were doing maintenance on it when I filmed, but you can see just how huge this thing is from even this far away. I think I can safely slot this guy into A tier, because even after all these years, being under this thing is still a crazy feeling. Also next to Pathfinder is another member of the list, the MPTA-098 module. Bad one. It's that one. You want me That's the yeah. That you one. fucking what? say that one too. That's the it's bit. The, it's, it's that one. It's, it's that one. It's that one. This is a test engine that's just kind of there. It's not very interesting, and you're not missing much. C tier. A sad exclusion from the list is the K-Rex, which used to sit nicely in the gift shop of the Space and Rocket Center, but has since been decommissioned for some reason. We looked around for it, but it seems they just took it apart rather than moved it. Fortunately, the final attraction at the center was still where it was left, the Grave of Miss Baker. This is a monument to the first monkey ever to come back from space alive. She's a cute little buddy, and people still leave bananas out for her to this day. Such as this one. There's a message on the banana. Miss Baker, thank you for your circus. That's like a, it's a pun. With the first area knocked out, we went to the next one in Huntsville, the Low Mill. Low Mill is, as the name suggests, an old mill that has since been converted into an artist's alley. Artists from around the Tennessee Valley show off and sell their stuff there, and it's not really usually very interesting. This is one that I've been to plenty of times before, and I can safely say that your experience depends heavily on whether an artist you care about is there or not. It's a venue. We didn't get there during open hours, but you're honestly not missing much from my experience. Our next stop, on the other hand, was the world-famous Dead Children's Playground, an infamous playground built dead center in the middle of a graveyard. So here we have, uh, it's, a, it's a normal playground, nice cliff, cliff faces around, no, just a perfectly normal playground, and um, we turn around. Kinda. It's a bit off to the side, but it's still weird. Definitely the place to be on Halloween in this town. Also, while we were there, we saw a dumpster filled to the brim with funeral flowers, and it never really clicked for me that, yeah, they probably just throw those away. Don't spend 70 bucks on a funeral bouquet, it just goes in here. 
Our final stop in Huntsville before we left on the trip for good was the old Hotel Montecito, an old hotel that used to stand on Huntsville's main mountain. That looks like someone's house. Yeah. Nowadays, it's just a tower with a plaque next to it. It's in someone's yard. We didn't stick around to film this one. Don't go here. This is someone's house. From here, it was off to Scottsboro, Alabama, for a place that I absolutely love, the Unclaimed Baggage Center. Have you ever wondered what happens if you just don't pick up your shit from unclaimed baggage? It goes here, to be sold at bargain bin prices. This store is sick. They've got everything. They have shirts, pants, jewelries, cameras, games, guns, and they even have liquids over four ounces, if you ask nicely. We just could not help ourselves. Good haul. Good haul. Good haul. So food? Yeah. After lunch at the nearby 50 Taters, it was off to Fackler, Alabama for the next two on our list, which were right next to each other. The first was Never Sink Pit, a beautiful looking sinkhole with a waterfall that was, according to Google, up a pleasant three foot elevation hike for half a mile. Halfway up a sheer cliff, we realized that was a fucking lie. Look at me. I'm not a hiker. I'm not in shape. I'm not gonna lie and pretend that I could do this hike even if I wasn't wearing slip-ons and sweatpants and it hadn't rained all day over the rocky trail. So I went back down and Jake got footage of the cliff because he actually likes hiking and was wearing boots and it's beautiful. Take a look at this cave, it's really nice and I'm sad I couldn't see it but I was going to die on that cliff. Right by the cave was, in the middle of someone's yard, the rock zoo. This is, well, you can see. It's a bunch of rocks painted to look like different animals and arranged all fun-like. For some reason I had it in my head that this was going to be like a petting zoo with staff and admission, I don't know why. Our next stop took us to Fort Payne, Alabama, home of the band Alabama, which was all over the town. We weren't there for them though, we were here for the Dye Ditch Gang, an art installation in a parking lot that's made of cloth soaked in dye from a local dye factory's runoff. It's cool I guess, but from here we had to beat feet over to Aniston to make it to our next two stops before closing time. Get a load of this, Alabama. Aniston had two museums that were right next to each other and both on the list, the Berman Museum and the Aniston Museum of Natural History. The Berman Museum was cool, it was a museum full of weapons from different wars in history. We got to see a grenade launcher from the 1800s, that was pretty neat, some swords, some guns, and a whole lot of spy stuff. We saw a lipstick gun, a bullet gun, a gun gun, it was all pretty cool. We gotta take a picture of that. The Natural History Museum was no slouch either. It had tons of different animals on display from all different biomes. You, you gotta, you gotta crouch down. I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> you gotta crouch down, Sean. <laughs> Beautiful. There wasn't really much natural history. It was mainly just different taxidermy animals, but you know, they're cool. Him. We got to find out if we were faster than a peregrine falcon. Hide. <laughs> Run. Once we were done looking at all the birdies, we headed back over to the world's largest office chair, which was built for a furniture store that no longer exists, so it's a lot lamer now. It's just in a parking lot. The last stop in Aniston was the German-Italian Cemetery, a cemetery built for the POWs killed during... Huh? It's like, it's like a Nazi commemorative cemetery. Dawn to dusk. Enemy prisoners of war cemetery. Prisoners of what war? Which one? You know, I have a hunch. Oh no, this was not good. It's, it's a very well-kept cemetery, but like, do I need to explain the problem here? That's an iron cross. That's a swastika eagle. We gotta get the hell out of here. And so we drove. Drove, drove, drove up a long, winding road to the next destination. It was 6 p.m. in Alabama, so it was pitch black for some fucking reason, and we were arriving at Chiaha Mountain in the murky darkness. Chiaha Mountain is a beautiful place during the day, but at night? So, it is currently 6.30, which means in Alabama, that means it's pitch black, so... We're not going to be able to walk up to the peak of Chiaha Mountain, but we got pretty far. We got to this trailhead here, and, um... And here's the parking lot. It's fucking empty. But yeah, we got... Sean? 
John? I can't say it's bad. I've seen it during the day, but we didn't really get much out of it here. Our final stop for the night was in the town of Lanet, and it's a sad story. Little Nadine Earls asked for a dollhouse for Christmas, but died a week before, so her parents decided to put the dollhouse on her grave and fill it with toys. It's a heartwarming story and a somber sight. During the day, we were there at night. There's someone coming. With the first day of travel finally behind us, we tucked in for the night and woke up bright and early in Auburn. Because you know the saying, the early bird gets to see the bird. Auburn is a college town known for its football team, and their slogan is War Eagle, so naturally, they have their own eagles that they fly over games sometimes. It's open for the public, and, huh? It's only by appointment. And it's for classes, so there's no way I could afford to visit it myself. That sucks. The only thing that would suck more is if the next destination were just someone's house and the atlas fucks up. Oh, son of a bitch. After running away from the inhabitants of the Not Museum of Wonder, we went to the drive through Museum, which was strange. It's essentially a bunch of storage containers filled with things you'd see at the Mystery Shack, a cabinet of curiosities that confound the cranium. This museum was only like half full, that was kinda lame, but it was free and it was cool. After this, we headed south to Eufaula, where we'd be seeing two attractions that were both relatively small. In someone's front yard is the tree that owns itself, which is not as unique as you may think, and even less interesting in person, but the other attraction. That was something special. In 1973, a man was fishing in Eufaula, Alabama, when he caught, using a strawberry gummy worm, a bass. This bass had gumption. He fought. He was rough and tumble. So the guy brought him back home to his bait shop and put him in a tank. This fish was named Leroy Brown, and he was the baddest fish in the whole damn town. He only ate strawberry gummy worms, he had attitude, and he was a lover boy. People came from miles around to visit Leroy Brown. When his fish wife died, he kept trying to push her back underwater because God accidentally gave this bass a soul. The fish eventually passed, and his funeral was attended by over 800 people. The Leroy Brown story is deep and complex. I didn't even get into how his remains were kidnapped for ransom, but that story is forever memorialized in Eufaula with the monument to Leroy Brown. Is, is Leroy Brown a fish? Yeah. Most bass are just fish, but Leroy Brown was something special. I fucking love this place. We stopped at the Leroy Brown gift shop and had some Leroy Brown coffee, and it was the best coffee I'd ever had in my life. I felt like Leroy Brown was watching over our trip, and his guiding fin would take us forward. We said goodbye to Leroy Brown and headed over to Clayton, Alabama for another attraction. On the way, we saw this quaint town square. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Uh oh. <laughs> so, getting out of there, our destination was a cemetery, and we had to be kind of quiet because not very far from us was an actual funeral being held, and two morons filming a gravestone that looks like a whiskey bottle aren't really funeral vibes. The story goes that a pissed off widow got this for her husband after he drank himself to death, which seems counterintuitive. Why not just, like, throw him in the river? Next up was Dothan with two attractions, the smallest city block on Earth, not verified by Guinness, mind you, and it's just an island in the middle of the road with a sign on it. It's pretty lame. The other attraction in Dothan is the peanut statues that pepper the town because peanuts are Dothan's claim to fame. There was construction all over the place, so we didn't track down any more than just the few we saw at the visitor center, but honestly, these are pretty cute. I could see a fun day tracking down all of these if I lived in Dothan. Also, I had to get my oil changed, which set us behind schedule a little bit, but my car was making funny noises, so... As we exited Dothan, we headed towards something that sounded weird and uninteresting. The Bull Weevil Monument in Enterprise, Alabama. A town neither of us had ever heard of or been to before. The pictures just looked like some random statue of a lady, but as we started to approach, things seemed off. Something was strange about this town. There were bull weevil themed hotels we were spotting, multiple bull weevil streets around. Then on Main Street, we were struck by the brilliance of Enterprise Alabama. They were in love with the bull weevil, and after this, so were we. 
In the middle of Town Square is a bull weevil monument, sure, but you also had bull weevil coffee shops, bull weevil souvenirs, a bull weevil mural. They had a bull weevil themed children's birthday party and a bull weevil themed children's play place. It felt like we had entered another dimension. It was magical, and I totally didn't fuck up filming. Sadly, we had to leave the land of the bull weevil, and the rest of the day was pretty much a bust, not gonna lie. Our next stop was Ozark, which is not really a town, more so just a collection of rural houses. Our GPS tried to route us through this. This is not a cemetery, is it? Wait, are we here? Uh... We went around only to find the least interesting place in the entire trip, the Long Street Cemetery. This is a cemetery in the middle of scenic nowhere that was formed by six smaller cemeteries merging together. Okay. This pissed me off and the next one didn't help, the Veterans Memorial Bridge. It's just an old ass bridge besides the highway, like there's nothing to this. So I do have, uh, I, uh, I think this is as good a time as any to complain about the Atlas because we just went to the Veterans Memorial Bridge and it was a very nice bridge but it was also in someone's driveway and I feel like the Atlas has a problem in that uh, you don't exactly have to go to the place you're submitting to the Atlas. Anybody can submit. Uh, some of the places that we've been so far were just people's houses and not like, like the Museum, and One Museum of Wonder and Seal didn't exist. Uh, so th that's my complaint as, as of right now is that uh, they need to not do that. <laughs> Returning to civilization after hours of driving through woodlands searching for nothing burgers of destinations, we hit Tuskegee, which was somehow still a bust. This is Booker T. Washington's home, The Oaks, which unfortunately was closed at the time despite the website saying it should be open about now. The house looked cool, but the last tour was some time ago, so that's about all we got. Also in Tuskegee was the Tuskegee Chapel, which from all my research is just a normal church. Why is this on the list? Leaving Tuskegee, we headed for Wetumpka, which is home to two alleged closed sites that kind of aren't. The Jasmine Hill Gardens and the Wetumpka Impact Crater, both marked as permanently closed on the Atlas. The Jasmine Hill Gardens are indeed closed to the public since the pandemic, but I've been to them before and they're pretty cool. Given that we saw lights up there, they're probably opening back up soon, or at least used for private gatherings and such, and I would recommend going because it's a cool place, but it goes in the closed tier now. The Wetumpka Impact Crater is also considered permanently closed, which is a problem, because it's about 4 billion a million and 3 miles wide. You can't close an impact crater that multiple towns are now sitting inside of. Here's the historical marker for the site of the crater, right outside an unassuming healthcare office. With the day's high highs and low lows behind us, we retired in Montgomery and we were up bright and early for a cluster of seven different attractions in the state capital. But before then, we had to go a bit out of town for the abandoned town of Spectre, Alabama. This is a town that was built on an island for the movie Big Fish, which neither of us have seen. It's pretty neat, I assume it would be more interesting if we actually saw the movie, but we did see these goats that didn't want us to leave. That's a good goat. They were very polite, though. Jake eventually lured them away with some Baja Blast and we got back to town. You know me, I'm probably the biggest country music fan in the world, so when I heard that Hank Williams was buried in Montgomery, famous singer of... I think he did something about a horse? Anyway, we went to Hank Williams' grave, which is covered in astroturf because fans of the Nashville legend kept picking the grass at his gravesite for some reason. Next stop was the Steiner Loebman building, which is an unassuming office building with a casket built into the roof facade. It's strange, but like, we couldn't really go up there to check it out, so you're just gonna get some shots from the street. A mysterious coffin on the ceiling of the Steiner Loebman building. A Hank Williams Museum that's closed until 1pm. The Hank Williams Museum was nearby, and home to the Hank Williams death car, the car he died of a heart attack in, but we weren't allowed to film in there, so I'm just gonna put it on screen right here, and moving on. We saw the Wounded Dove Memorial, which was commissioned by one of the popes themselves, the Civil Rights Memorial was nice, very pretty, take a look. 
me and Jake actually mistook this other monument in front of a bank for the Civil Rights Monument, and we were very confused that the Civil Rights Memorial was mainly about assets and investment opportunities, but that was just our GPS fucking up. Oh no. Oh no. There's no way to not have this be a torpedo in the tone of the video. The next stop was a very visceral and powerful walk through Memorial Garden to the victims of lynching in America. I'll show you some footage, but I'm excluding some parts that I genuinely don't think I can show on YouTube. It's a great memorial, and you should definitely go see it if you get the chance, but it's not really in the same ballpark as the others on this list, so I'm gonna put it in its own tier of I would feel uncomfortable putting this next to the funny fish statue. Also, our final stop in Montgomery was another museum, the F. Scott Fitzgerald Museum, but we weren't allowed to film there either, so here's some stuff from the inside that I found on Google Images. It was fine. Finally leaving Montgomery, we headed towards probably the most famous ghost town in Alabama, Old Cahaba. This place is always at the top of ghost town lists, and upon seeing it for myself, wow, it absolutely shouldn't be. You want to know what my favorite thing about old-timey buildings is? Having to comply with modern fire codes. It's a fine historical site, but there's literally like two buildings still standing. The bathrooms outnumber the old buildings here. It's kind of funny how pathetic the park is. I'm sure there's some stuff we didn't see, but this is really, really lame. I'm sorry. You ever go to English class? Because you should recognize this next spot. It's the courthouse that To Kill a Mockingbird was based on. Fun fact, To Kill a Mockingbird is one of the only classic literature works that's actually any good, so I kind of like this place. We couldn't go inside, but we got to see the memorial for Atticus Finch, who is dead now apparently, and it was a pretty alright place. If you're a Harper Lee super fan, buy your tickets now. We intentionally skipped past some places we knew we would be doubling back for later in order to make it down to our hotel in Orange Beach, but not before eating at the world famous Lambert's. This is a place I always loved going when I was a kid, and unlike almost every other place in that list, it's actually really good as an adult. Lambert specializes in southern cooking, you know, collards, green beans, polis sausage, sauerkraut, cornbread, and their specialty, piping hot rolls thrown directly at your table by former baseball pitchers. Highly recommend if you're in the area of Foley, Alabama, this place slaps. We also absolutely had to stop at this place we saw. Vape, CBD, adult gifts, read the Bible! I almost flipped my car turning into this place so fast. At 8 in the morning, Jake insisted that we go barefoot out onto the beach, despite there being a tornado watch in the beach looking like this, so here's footage of that. It was about as much fun as it looks. We were off to Fort Morgan first thing in the morning, a fort located on the very tip of Alabama's teeny tiny coastline. It's a pretty nice place, but it had clearly seen better days. The ferry to the other side of the bay wasn't working, which we actually planned around, and that's why we were doubling back now. Headed to the first of two locations right next to each other. Off the road to the Barber Marina is an unassuming gravel path that leads you into this. It's a full replica of Stonehenge, except this one's made of plexiglass, and unlike the real Stonehenge, you can actually go up to it. But this wasn't the only thing along the path to the marina, no no no. There were dinosaurs in these woods, there were statues, there was... The giant enemy spider! What the hell is this place? The Barber Marina is a marina owned by the Barber Group, an investment company that decided to make a marina for whatever reason, and this place is sick. It's covered over in weird sculptures like the aforementioned Bama Hinge and this lady just chilling in the water. Also, we got to play with these lovely cats in the marina shop, and they were absolutely precious in every way. This place is really cool. All that it's missing is like a nice fish restaurant to cook up your catches. Barber Company. Hit me up, I know a cook, and he makes a mean hamachi crudo. Going back up, we went to Foley for the Holmes Medical Museum, which was interesting. First of all, it's free, which was great news, because the entry fees for all these museums were starting to add up at this point, and I'll take any freebies I can get. This place used to be a hospital until the doctor operating it moved one day and just didn't take any of his shit with him. So it was like a time capsule to when you could just get cocaine over the counter. There were all sorts of old-timey medicines, and it was only mildly creepy, but my heart was set across the street on a building that had caught my eye since the drive down. Action, video game, and movie. I had to see what was inside. I'd seen action, video game, and I'd seen movie, but both at the same time? Walking in, we were amazed to see a mostly mediocre retro game shop. The prices were alright, but the selection wasn't anything to write home about. 
We also stopped into a bookstore and Jake found a recipe book from the 1950s with some absolute gems in it. Heading back up to Cross into Mobile, we had two more stops before then, first of which was the Spear Hunting Museum, a museum dedicated to the greatest spear hunter to ever live, according to the museum itself. Now, doing research for this thing, I kind of assumed that this place full of taxidermy lions and elephants and other endangered species would mainly be comprised of animals that were hunted in, like, the 1800s, and this spear hunter guy was like a Dr. Livingstone type. He died in 2011. So I'm just seeing accolades of this guy killing lions with spears in, like, 2006, and I'm thinking, man, I, I didn't know you could get away with that shit that late. I remember the Cecil the Lion guy. Everybody hated him. Also, this place smells like shit. I don't know why, it just smelled horrible the whole time, and both me and Jake skimmed through it because of the smell. I guess it's cool to see all the taxidermy animals, but it's weird vibes at best, and at worst, it's mmm. Tucked away in a parking lot is a small hut called Tolstoy Park. The lore of this place is that after being diagnosed with tuberculosis, a poet moved down into this tiny building and did his poetry until he died. It's pretty cool, honestly. I signed the guest book with a little goat. The drive to Mobile was uneventful, but we kept seeing signs for Mardi Gras because it was happening tomorrow, which made it Lundi Gras as we entered the city. Mobile is the first place in the U.S. that actually celebrated Mardi Gras, so they're kind of known as the second-in-command after Nowlands, of course. That would have to wait, though, because we had to hit one of two locations in Mobile, Stan Gall Field, which is the oldest continually operated college baseball field in the continental United States. That turned lame like two qualifiers ago, didn't it? You're gonna have the oldest baseball field in the world, and it's great. Oldest baseball field in the U.S., and it's cool. But once you get down to the oldest continually operated college baseball field in the continental United States, it's just fucking lame. Also, it has no seats. We stayed in Mobile for the night and went downtown to enjoy the Mardi Gras festivities, and man, they kinda sucked. All the parades had already happened and the food trucks were all closing up shop, which is our own fault, but parking was $50, and I don't give a shit how cool your Mardi Gras is, it's not okay to charge 50 bucks for parking. <laughs> Try to walk under this thing real quick. It almost, almost <laughs> hit. I'm sorry, Mobile. Maybe tomorrow we'll redeem you. So the next day, we spent like two hours hanging out with Ronald McDonald waiting for a museum to open up that never did. This is the Mobile Medical Museum, a little museum tucked away in the corner of a hospital district right next to a Ronald McDonald house that we thought it was for a while. We waited like two hours for these fuckers to open up, and they didn't. I guess they took off for Mardi Gras, but I was so mad. You got beef with Donald? We got beef. He's got most of the beef. It didn't help that this was after a whole lot of nothing as we drove back up north for four hours without stop. Our long trek was paused at Carrollton, Alabama's famous courthouse. Don't know the name? How about the face? This is Henry Wells' face, permanently etched into the window of the town courthouse. The story goes that he was hunted by an angry mob and stayed hidden in the courthouse watching outside when lightning struck, immortalizing its gone it's, they, they got rid of the window pane. No, that can't be right. No, yeah, it, it's gone. The window just isn't there anymore. Why would you get rid of that? It's the only thing that ever happened in fucking Carrollton, Alabama. We drove off to Tuscaloosa next and spirits were kind of low. It had been a mostly driving day with two non-interesting stops along the way, but hopefully Tuscaloosa would fix that. Smile. Well, it kind of did because Tuscaloosa has some cool stuff. Here is Capitol Park, the remains of the old Capitol building of Alabama back when it was in Tuscaloosa. It's pretty well kept and has a nice walkthrough. What wasn't nice to walk through was the campus of the University of Alabama. God, this place is a nightmare. I had to stay in the car while Jake filmed this cool near automata robot because we had nowhere to park. But we did manage to make it just in time before the Tuscaloosa Museum of Natural History closed. This museum is not what we're here for. What we're here for is this. The Hodges Meteorite. Alabama's motto to those who are unaware is stars rain on Alabama, and it's because of this guy right here. See, in the town of Silicaga, which we will be visiting later, by the way, a woman was taking a nap when she was suddenly struck in the abdomen by a fucking meteor that crashed through her roof. She was fine, and actually had to sue her landlord who claimed that the meteor that crashed into her belly belonged to him. 
This is the only verified time that a meteor has ever hit someone before, and you can see that funky rock right here. Next up was Moundville, a historical Native American mound site. We had both been there before, so here's some footage of the mounds themselves. They are big, I think they speak for themselves. It's at this point that I have to come to you with a confession. I didn't think we would go to this next place. It got added in after I had already made the map for the trip, so it was smack dab in between two corners of our route, and it didn't fit nicely in anywhere. It was a two-hour detour regardless of where I cut it from, so I just contemplated ignoring it entirely. But I go the extra mile for my fans. And we drove into the night to this fucking thing, and here it is. The Clanton Giant Peach is a peach water tower that meant we had to work extra hard the next day to make up lost time, and I'm not happy about it. We're not even the peach guys, that's Georgia. Fortunately, this day ended on a high note as me and Jake went to Ore Park in Montevallo. This park is known for its trees that are carved into the shapes of different guys. During the day, a whimsical adventure through a fun forest. At night? We ran back to Birmingham to sleep. Waking up in Birmingham, something wasn't right. Jake felt bad, and not his normal bad, he felt really bad. We kept pushing through to the next two spots, both of which were supposed to hit yesterday if a certain peach didn't sap three hours of our time, but the energy was not the same. The Red Mountain Park, from what I understand, is just a very large wooded area in Birmingham. It's fine if you like that sort of thing, but I don't like hiking and Jake is about half dead, so we moved on pretty quick. The Tan Hill Ironworks were more my style, a campground made in the ruins of an old ironworking plant. We got to see lots of nature, lots of ironworking stuff, and then we had to make tracks. With a mixture of an entire bottle of NyQuil and a Red Bull mixed together in them, which I would like to volunteer the name Fall Over and Die to, we headed to the American Village in Montevallo, which wasn't open last night so we had to double back for it. Thank you, Giant Peach. We weren't interested in the village itself, rather a traveling roadshow that had made its permanent home inside of the village, the Randall Pettis Miniature Museum. These little miniatures take us through the history of America, and I have to be really careful with the footage here because there were kids all over the place bumping into us the whole time, and for those unaware, you have to mark every child that appears in a YouTube video as either your own or a paid actor, or YouTube has carte blanche to nuke the whole thing from orbit. Leaving that, we made it back up to Birmingham to get started on our biggest cluster of attractions in the whole state, starting with the African Village, which is... well, I think I'll just show you. Oh hey, there's a... oh, it's a Bible verse. I don't know what exactly to say about the African village. It's cool, and it also feels like a monument to schizophrenia, which by my money, makes it more cool. Here's the Thomas Jefferson Tower, unremarkable except for that little spire up top. That spire is a Zeppelin port. Now, since zeppelins are a largely horrible means of transportation, the spire doesn't get used anymore, but I like to imagine a future in which the Hindenburg never happened and you could just travel to Birmingham by blimp. Our next stop was something absolutely magical. It's one of the coolest places on the trip, I'm giving it an S tier right away and you're about to see why. This is the Museum of Fond Memories, a bookstore filled to the brim with ancient stuff. Looking through the books here, I struggled to find anything that was younger than I was. It's a fucking insane place. Jake found a cookbook from the 1880s, I found a Japanese illustrated travel guide from 1930, and we bought both of them because oh my god, it's cool. I'm not even a book, Andy. This was just the coolest place ever. Go here and give Mr. Reed your money. He's so nice, and his store is amazing. I will be back here in the future whenever I'm in Birmingham. S tier straight to F tier with the heaviest corner on earth, which is a corner with four bank buildings built there. When they were constructed however many decades ago, it was called the heaviest corner on earth to build publicity. You wanna know how uninteresting this is? There's not even a plaque. The tree had a plaque, and this doesn't. 
Unfortunately, the next two were both ones we couldn't see. The donor memorial is a memorial to organ donors near the hospital district of Birmingham, but had construction in front of it so we couldn't even get near it. Quinlan Castle is a castle that used to be a foreboding piece of architecture and is now gone. They tore down the castle. Couldn't find a renter, I guess. Teared down a fucking castle, landowners. Tear down a giant cool castle to build a fucking Panera Bread and a $5,000 a month townhouse. This lovely goat man here is the Storyteller, a monument to a woman's murdered artist child. Recently, it's come under fire for satanic imagery from statue PFPs on Twitter, but it's actually a very lovely fountain surrounded by a bunch of great restaurants. We caught it on a day off, though, because the fountain was off and there was somebody sleeping on it. The Alabama Booksmith was another bookstore, and this time I'm the one filming because Jake was dissolving at this point and told me to just take the camera for him. The gimmick of this place is that they only sell signed books and at MSRP. Cool if you like that sort of thing. I don't. Our final two in Birmingham we got drive-bys of. Here is the statue of Vulcan, god of the forge, with his own little Vulcan sticking out down there. This is the Sloss Furnaces, an insanely haunted old furnace plant that's been used as a venue for years now. As opposed to Low Mill, the Sloss Furnaces are actually cool as fuck, even if Rage Against the Machine aren't playing there. Here's the inside and photographs, because we couldn't spend the whole day touring the place. It was a calm drive to Vestavia Hills, where we encountered what I can only describe as a Boy Scout compound. I didn't really think that the Boy Scouts were a thing anymore, but this area begged to differ, with stores and buildings for them, and what were we here to see? This giant Statue of Liberty replica. Why is this here, and what does it have to do with the Boy Scouts? Fuck if I know, your popcorn sucks. Our last stop of the day brought us back to my favorite company in the whole wide world, Barber, who were kind enough to build a museum dedicated to motorsport in absolute nowhere Alabama. Why? Who knows, but goddamn if this wasn't sick as hell. This place was full of so many weird-ass cars and weird-ass bikes that I'm gonna struggle to show you all the footage because there were so many. It was built like a massive garage. I don't understand you, Barber, but I feel you, and I love you. Do I make you horny, baby? Unfortunately, by the end of the museum, Jake was feeling bad to the point that even a trip to Bucky's didn't cheer him up. So we decided to postpone the rest of the trip and make the drive back home. It's a shame, really. Some people are born with so much willpower to do trips like this, and some others are just lacking that willpower. I feel bad for people like- It was the flu, and I got it like a day later, and we both spent two weeks in misery. We're fucking back. I'm finally not actively dying. So despite that minor setback, we're almost done, and we have about 11 more to go, starting in Silacauga, Alabama. This is the monument to the Hodges meteor I mentioned earlier. You know, the one that bonked the lady in the belly real good. This is a sculpture commemorating it, and honestly, I feel like this is a major missed opportunity to put the meteorite inside the sculpture. As it is, it's just kind of there and attached to a cool story while the meteor's off in Tuscaloosa. Minus two. Now, I really thought that the craziest stuff on this trip was behind us, but as we drove up to one of the hardest places to plan around in the entire trip, DeSoto Caverns, this place was fucking weird. You'd think that a cave would be the main attraction, but DeSoto Caverns has done all they can to... I don't really know how else to say it, Kids Science museum Museumify a natural landmark. There's water balloon fighting attractions, games, a gift shop with suspiciously absent price tags. It was bizarre energy going in, especially when we waited for the tour to start for like an hour until someone showed up for just the two of us. And it got even weirder when we actually went into the cave. The tour guide was clearly on script and kept waiting for me to respond to jokes aimed at like 11 year olds and I'm 24. It was surreal. At one point he asked me if I knew what guano was, and I said, yeah, and he said, what is it? And I said, it's bat poop, and he said, bat poop? Isn't that gross? And waited for a response until I said, yeah. At one point he told us of the remains of several native chiefs that were buried in the cave at a specific spot, and that the ceremony was so sacred that nobody from outside the tribes was allowed in. Which made it all the more jarring when at the end of the tour there was a laser light show over the grave site. The cave was beautiful, and despite everything else, I think I'm gonna give DeSoto Caverns an A tier because it was exactly the kind of batshit insane I'm looking for in this trip. 
Another cave next, Rickwood Caverns, is a lot more what you'd expect. It's actually a campsite with a lot of caves near it. The one we were able to see was fenced off, and from what I understand you need a guide to actually go into these, but it seemed like a decent enough place to camp. In Cullman, we went to the Ave Maria Grotto, a small path near a convent that's usually one of the coolest on the list. The grotto consists of hundreds of miniature dioramas created by a monk over his years in the church. They're incredibly detailed and showcase all these churches from around the world and sometimes other stuff too, like the Alamo, the most sacred of convents. I firmly believe that if he had lived to see it, there would be a crusty crab in this grotto. Also, they sold baked goods and, you know, Catholics make crazy shortbread. Highly recommend. The next stop was the Alabama Natural Bridge, and nope, it's closed. There's not any hours listed on this thing, it's just closed. Same for the next one, too, which is a shame, because the Dismals is a beautiful place with a glowworm native only to it. The images of these glowworms in season is something else, check them out. But unfortunately, we returned away at the gate. I guess it wouldn't be the final stretch without another attraction that was closed without warning. We woke up feeling better than ever, ready to tackle the final five, starting with... I don't think I can say that on YouTube. I think the algorithm will think I'm saying a slur even though I'm not, so I'm gonna beep it out. The Dog Cemetery is a surprisingly ornate cemetery in the middle of nowhere where people all around the world can bury their dogs. There are so many statues to these guys, it's genuinely more impressive than some of the normal cemeteries we went to. I signed my goat in another guest book and we were off. It's the final four! It's the final four! The final four. One last closed one, but luckily it was one we were actually able to go up to and see firsthand. This is the Rattlesnake Saloon, a saloon built into a cave. It's pretty cool, and I'll definitely be coming back here once renovations are done, but unfortunately we were unable to procure a $13 Michelob Ultralight at this time. Three left, and here we have Helen Keller's Water Pump. Not the birthplace itself, just the water pump. I'm sure that if you're into Helen Keller, for whatever reason, this has significance to you, but I don't think I've ever met or will ever meet someone from my generation who has strong feelings about Helen Keller. What do you call thirsty Helen Keller? Helen Keller when she hasn't had anything to drink for a while. The house itself is cool and has lots of history to it, but just the water pump? Boring. We could feel the end approaching as we entered Florence to see the Frank Lloyd Wright Rosenbaum house. Frank Lloyd Wright, for those who are unaware, was an eccentric architect who championed his own style of house building in the first half of the 20th century. He called it Usonian, which is a word in reference to a fictional union between the Canada, the USA, and Mexico, saying that his houses would be the ubiquitous style in this new American architecture. They don't make weirdos how they used to. The house itself is pretty cool, but I'm six foot six, and Frank Lloyd Wright did not make houses for people like me. And... At long last, we reached the final destination, and it was... a wall? It's in memory of a Native American's journey back home after expulsion from her homeland, and it's very serene, but kind of an anti-climax. Oh well. We're done! That was honestly a lot of fun. There were plenty of moments of, oh that's lame, or oh that's closed, but if I'm being honest with myself, this whole journey was exactly what I started this channel for exploring the goofy, forgotten side of history and geography. I see all the time Alabama's government being stupid on the news, and it gets lambasted, for good reason, but it was honestly kind of nice to see the little bits of culture that rarely go outside their hometown. Even the most boring of these, Longstreet Cemetery in Ozark, Alabama to be specific, is probably known to locals, and even at its most mundane, it was still an injection of authentic and bizarre Americana. I think... I think I'd be happy to do this again someday. What do we have around me? We can hit su- What the fuck do you mean Tennessee has 155?